Peatland Archaeology post Kyoto Protocol. It's actually not the best title, I realised, after having written it and sent it off. We're not post Kyoto Protocol, we're in the second commitment phase. So just to put that apology in there before I get going. So really, I've kind of got several aims here. Um, some of this material I'm talking about is a bit dry, I must admit, which on day three of a conference is maybe not ideal. Some of it is actually probably a bit boring. What I'm going to try and do is suggest that this is something that we need to engage with on some levels. Jen just referred to the fact that dealing with climate change and historic environment is a sort of multi-scalar, multi-agency multi issue. So I think I'm trying to situate that within, within that sort of um, picture, if you like. So I'm going to do several things. Highlight connections between current agendas in conservation and restoration of peatlands and peatland archaeology more broadly. And very briefly, summarise the relationships of these agendas to developments arising in some senses from Kyoto and especially the second commitment phase that we are now in, as I just mentioned. I'm going to touch on the ecosystem services framework. A lot of people don't like this. A lot of people get really bored when you talk about it. So I'm not going to say a huge pile about it, other than to make the point that I think as archaeologists, we need to engage with it, even if we think, even if we're not happy with it in some ways. And I know some archaeologists don't like it. So anyway, and that's what I'm saying, really, suggest that all of archaeology, not just peatland archaeology, should at least be aware of some of the, these agendas and engage with them in some measure. Okay, so peatlands, around about 3% of the terrestrial land surface of the earth is peatland um, of one form or another. Mostly, of course, in, in the northern hemisphere, but also around the equator, southern hemisphere. You may have seen the news a few weeks ago, huge areas of peatlands currently being discovered in areas like the Amazon. So a very important ecosystem in all sorts of ways. Um, as we'll see in a minute, very few peatlands are not disturbed in one way or another. Okay, so that's maybe a picture of at least a sort of boreal peatland in Estonia, what they, what they look like when they're minimally disturbed. Not many of those left, really. So most peatlands look a bit more like this, being impacted in, on, in one way or another. Um, so as I just said, 2-3% to, uh, two to of the land surface of the Earth, but a very large accumulation of organic matter, um, approximately one-third of the terrestrial carbon pool, or if you want to think about it like this, about twice the amount of biomass in the entire world's forest is in peatlands. Okay, so that's a lot of organic matter. Drain peatlands are responsible for an estimated around about 6% total anthropogenic GHG emissions, okay? Um, and to come back to the disturbance thing, it's been suggested that maybe only 10% of peatlands across the world are, are, are um, undisturbed, whatever that means, and that's debatable. Okay, excuse to show some lovely pictures of wetland archaeology. Um, peatlands are obviously very important for archaeology. The ironic thing, of course, is we only know there's archaeology in peatlands when peatlands are being disturbed or cut. So hence, of course, knowledge of peatlands in areas such as Ireland, where, where I'm based at the moment, the Netherlands, southwest England, the Sweet Track, of course. Since we're in Scotland, the Balahulish goddess, or the Balahulish figure, Iron Age is rather any basic Iron Age figure from the bottom of the peatland, from not too far from here. And of course, the paleo environmental record. So very important for archaeologists. And of course, the fate of archaeology in peatlands is closely tied to the fate of peatland ecosystems themselves, of course. And again, there's some very high profile examples of this um, in recent years. Star Car, of course, up there. Um, other problems, Irish peatlands, peat cutting, all these sorts of issues um, obviously impact on archaeology and our ability to protect and manage the archaeological resource in peatland. Now, in theory, a range of instruments are in place to protect peatland archaeology, in inverted commas. How well these work is, well, you know, debatable. Quote by Richard Brunning, who's speaking in the other session um, shortly. Uh, the well-proven extensive and rapid destruction of waterlogged archaeological deposits in European peatlands should be regarded as a significant crisis. Okay, so just to restate that, whatever happens to peatlands it affects the archaeology within the peatlands, obviously. And again, other examples of this. Big problem here, of course, is, is it's not just peat cutting, direct threats, indirect threats as well. So whatever happens to a peatland, if it's being drained, if it has archaeology in it, that will impact on the archaeology. Another quick example, the site of um, Flag Fen, um, over in England, eastern England, Cambridgeshire Fens. Recent interventions there onto the organic component of the archaeology of the post road suggest that the wood there is drying out. Okay, Ian Pant, who looked at the wood, um, used another word, what's happening to the wood there, anyone who was in that meeting, I don't know in the room, I'm not going to repeat it, certainly not on video. So big problems. Okay. To make matters worse, we have the impact of, pe of climate change on peatlands. Now again, this is the climate, this science behind this is quite difficult and uh, kind of, there's a lot of debate about it basically. But certainly peatlands may respond in various ways. Um, this is a recent-ish quote. Uh, it's been suggested that, that many surviving raised bogs in northwest Europe could ultimately lose their sphagnum species and become rapidly dominated by vascular plants. 
So obviously, again, impacts on any archaeology within those sorts of systems. If you've got trees growing on peatlands, drying out the peatlands more, and of course, even if there's no archaeology there, there's the paleoenvironmental record. So all peatlands have some sort of value in that sense. So what's going to happen to peatlands as the climate changes? Again, highly complex, as we've heard already. Okay. So just to move quickly onto the Kyoto Protocol. Okay, so as I say, we're into the second commitment phase now. Essentially, Kyoto, and this is the only bit of Kyoto that's relatively easy to understand, um, Kyoto commits state parties to reducing greenhouse gas emissions on two premises. One, that global warming is happening, and two, that people are causing it, human activities are contributing directly to it. Everything after that in Kyoto is rather difficult to understand, okay? So let's not worry about it too much, other than to pull out this fact. Not much attention has been paid to peatlands in um, Kyoto until quite recently. And as of the second commitment phase, Annex 1 countries, that's essentially countries, developed countries, can now include drainage, uh, wetland drainage and re-wetting to meet their emission targets under Kyoto. Okay? It's quite important. And as I say, the mechanisms and legislation are complex and at times apparently highly contradictory if you ever try to pick this apart. So, for example, within Europe, um, common agricultural policy, you can still get... Um, EU direct payments for agriculture on deeply drained peatland, despite this drive towards peatland rewetting and restoration. So it's, it's not easy. This is a take home point, I think, for me anyway, and that is that peatland restoration and conservation is receiving increasing political interest. It's moving more and more centre stage, particularly with this um, mechanisms whereby peatland, peatland rewetting can contribute towards emission targets. Okay? And we have to see this within the increasing role of ecosystem services framework. And just a quick sort of straw poll how many people have sort of come across the ecosystem services previously just out of interest? Oh, quite a few then. Okay, good. Um, and again, this is not something I'm going to go into in too much detail. Um, some of you know already what the devil ecosystem services are, but the benefit of those other people who are still with me here, a short quote, ecosystem services are the benefits provided to humans through the transformations of resources or environmental assets, including land, water, vegetation, and atmosphere, into a flow of essential goods and services, for example, clean air, water, food, and so forth. You might want to look at it a little bit like that, I don't know how well you can see it. Ecosystem services arrive from ecosystem functions which are related to biodiversity. You okay? can't see that very well. Maybe look at it in more detail later if, if, if you're interested. What is important for us as archaeologists is included within the ecosystem services framework archaeolo is archaeology, or archaeology can be incorporated within this framework of services which include supporting services, regulating services, provisioning services. So essentially, we have a space within this framework alongside uh, processes such as, uh, as I mentioned, carbon accumulation, restoration of peatlands. Archaeology can be in there alongside these potential services peatlands provide, such as climate change mitigation, which I'll come on to a tick. How do Okay. So to answer the question, what the hell does this have to do with the archaeology? And I've kind of really answered my question in advance because it looks like this, really. And again, this is a, unfortunately, I'm sorry I have to do this. It's a slight, a slight plug for a paper which has come out recently. So if anyone's interested in looking at this in more detail, I can give you a copy of this paper that's just come out. And that is the fact, within this cultural services section of ecosystem services, it kind of breaks down to this sort of thing of division and group and class examples. So the main thing to bear in mind here, and this is just part of the common international classification of ecosystem services, there's lots of acronyms in ecosystem services, and in Kyoto, for that matter. We can include archaeology and the archaeovermental record, OK? So alongside these other provisioning services that ecosystems provide. And again, sorry, another plug. So if we think about peatland archaeology, we can kind of think of the peatland ar archive, if you like, as, as providing this sort of intersection of records of climate change, the archaeological record, and also conservation ecology. Thanks. And again, if you're interested in that, I can um, talk more about that later. So what does this kind of equate to? Well, at the moment, we're seeing a lot of interest, as I've said, in peatland restoration programmes and the... IUCN in particular, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, have a big peatland restoration programme going on at the moment. Some of you may, may be aware of that. So re-wetting, blocking of drains, <laughs> restoring peatland. It's a big, big drive to this in Scotland in particular at the moment. They plan to restore at least 1 million hectares of peatland by 2020. Okay. And why is this? For all sorts of reasons to do with ecosystem services, biodiversity, water regulation, recreation, and potentially for climate change mitigation. Healthy peatlands sequester carbon. Okay, So the potential carbon sinks as opposed to carbon sources when they're functioning and doing what peatlands are meant to do, if you want to think of it like that. <coughs> and again, this obviously ties up with archaeology in terms of restoration and conservation programmes. So this is a site in Hatfield Moors in eastern England that I worked on with colleagues um, some years ago. Hatfield Moors is a cut peatland, but it's now being re-wet. 
regenerated, if you like. <coughs> we worked on, on the site, not least the Neolithic trackway at the bottom of the peatlands. Now, the trackway is completely knackered, nearly used Ian's word there. So, you know, that's, there's lots of debate about whether this kind of fragment could be preserved in situ. The important thing, of course, is rewetting peatlands will not restore sites that are, that are done in already. But we need to input into these programs as archaeologists, not least to make sure that conservation programs do not Im impact on any archaeology that is there already. It doesn't really matter whether you're cutting peat to burn it, or digging the drain, or blocking a, blocking a dike to, um, to restore the peatland. There still might be archaeology that can still be impacted on. So we need to be aware of these peatland restoration programs and make sure they're not just going off and doing their own thing. It's one point. Okay. Something else is important here, and it's about money, people. I'm going to suggest it's about money. And this is what Akim Steiner, who's Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme, he said this. Protecting and restoring peatlands is perhaps another key low-hanging fruit and among the most cost-effective options for climate change mitigation. Okay? So this is what I'm saying. Peatland restoration is moving centre stage, lots of interest in it, and potentially quite a lot of money in this as well. It all comes down to money in the end. Right, so I'm going to tie up. Hopefully you've kind of stayed with me on this, but just to kind of summarise what I'm trying to suggest. So peatlands are threatened by various factors. Okay? The fate of the archaeological environmental record is directly tied to the fate of peatlands. Whatever happens to peatlands, if it's good, it's good for archaeology and theory. If it's bad, it's bad for the archaeological record. As I've said several times, peatlands are moving centre stage in many ways in terms of some of these climate change debates, particularly in terms of possible impacts of global warming on peatlands. All sorts of interesting science about this, and again, a lot of the debate about it is not straightforward. I have a colleague in Cork who's working on what's called the compass bomb scenario, which is what, what, what might happen to peatlands under accelerated rates of global warming, and that's a bad thing in terms of tipping points, so really bad things could happen. So again, this is why there's a lot of interest in peatlands. However, when peatlands are doing what they're meant to do, they, they can act as, as carbon sinks. Okay, again, I've said this several times. These restoration programmes are getting more and more political interest behind them, not just in Europe, globally as well, all over the place. So again, more practically speaking, in theory, this should be good for the archaeological record, as long as we're aware that this is happening, inputting into these programmes wherever possible. Okay, so that's an important thing of kind of just involvement with other agencies. And again, to come back to where I, where I was sort of finishing there, Kyoto has created what was referred to as a carb, the carbon markets. I'm sure you've all read about this sort of, sort of stuff. And there's potential here for tapping into, I think, for tapping into funding. Particularly is what is called PES, I told there's lots of acronyms, Payments for Ecosystem Services Schemes, and these are starting to really spread. Okay? Okay? At the moment, there's only what's referred to as a largely voluntary market, which in 2010 was valued at 394 million, okay? as opposed to the compliance market, which is an astonishing 142 billion. Right, I'm nearly done. So, what I'm saying here is as these peatland restoration <coughs> programs gather speed and gather interest, and indeed gather money as people put money into restoration programs as part of this voluntary market. There's potential for us as archaeologists to get involved, as peatland archaeologists to get involved in this, and maybe to get money to deliver archaeological benefits. Okay? Maybe. A bit blue skies, this, I know. So I'm suggesting there's a place for archaeology and archaeologists, particularly you know, within the context of peatland archaeology, but not just peatland archaeology. Looking more broadly at the ecosystem services framework, and there's a lot of work and thought about this, particularly in terms of what we refer to as cultural services, sense of place, all this sort of stuff. Archaeology can feed directly into that. And the ecosystem services framework in particular has a lot of political will behind it at the moment. And again, you might not like the idea of it, and as I said at the start, a lot of people don't. But I don't think that's a reason to ignore it. And I think sometimes as archaeologists, we kind of have our own valuation programmes that we talk about and argue about at conferences, and they're often not very well understood outside the profession, I don't think. And I think at the very least, we need to be talking to people more broadly, as refer to the point that Jen made, and, and maybe trying to engage in some of these sorts of debates. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm finishing early, so hopefully I won't need to be wrestled to the ground. <laughs> Thank you.